Hi everyone, welcome into another episode of Sometimes Game Week. We are back in the studio with a lot of playoff action to discuss. First, we've got to thank our content partner, ABC, for sharing this on their Facebook Facebook page. Excuse me, can't talk today. Thanks guys for sharing this. Thank you all to tuning in for tuning in. Um, send us your questions throughout the show. First up, as we always get to, is our news of the day. What is on the agenda? We've got some basketball to talk about. Not a lot of like actual news news, news but things happening. You know, girls basketball starts today. Mm -hmm. um, boys basketball is next week, so we are officially into the winter season. How mm -hmm. exciting. Um, I, I think a, kind of a newsy thing we'll mention. I wrote about it in the paper today and online. The Catholic League, the new super Catholic League of the Chicago Catholic League and East Suburban Catholic League combined just had a heck of a quarterfinal. They've got eight teams still remaining in the state playoffs. Mm -hmm. We could have like almost an all Catholic League Saturday, which a lot of people joke that the IHSA hates that and blah, blah, blah. I don't think the IHSA cares too much <laughs> if a lot of people show up, which it would if it was all those games. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of interesting, a little newsy item. And then the other big news, No Shot Clock, the high school basketball podcast that Joe Hendrickson and I do Woo. is back week later than maybe we should have been, but um, <laughs> we are back and we made up for it with a really long episode. You can listen to that on online now. I know I teased last week at the end of the show that maybe we'd release the Basketball Super 25 on game week. That's not happening. Instead, <laughs> if you want it, you're going to have to go to No Shot Clock. We break all the top 25 teams down in depth. So you can catch that there. And let's go right into the other big news, signing day. Mm -hmm. Wednesday, the basketball players can sign their national letters of intent. Um, kind of go down the list here quickly. We can do that because it's not very long, which is sad to a lot of us. There are 16 players expected to sign, uh -huh. which has kind of become the new normal. I was looking it up before the show. Last year we had 14, 18 in 2016, 15 in 2015. That's what was the craziest low. year you remember covering? Oh, we've had, I know we've had well, I mean, regularly we used to get 30. We have had 60 before. Uh -huh. um, the last time it was close to what we used to consider normal was 2014 when we had 24. But the other thing is, like that year we had 10 high majors. Mm -hmm. This year, mm, we don't. We, I mean, I'm not sure if you want to argue about it. You know, Loyola made the final four, but I don't think you can really call them a high major. Right. You could kind of say we have maybe none right. <laughs> this year. What's the reason so that's for tough. that? I mean, nobody really knows. We feel like we're in this valley, natural valley, but it keeps going Down, now. Right. Yeah, and you know, the population loss has been one thing. You know, that's uh, talked about a lot in the news. You know, there's less kids in the city. There's less kids in the suburbs. Illinois is losing population. Mm -hmm. We've lost some high profile players to prep schools, but I mean, it's just drastic. Uh, and it's, I mean, looking at this group of kids, you know, you don't want to rip kids or anything, but it, it's just not up to the level that we were used to, you know, for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's um, because everyone else is getting better? And Chicago is staying the same, or is Chicago truly getting worse? Yeah, it's interesting because Chicago, whenever you hear people talk about Thanks. Chicago basketball, mm -hmm. they're always in the same conversation as like LA, New York, yeah. on the East Coast. <clears throat> and I don't know, can we still be in that same category? The la I mean, it's getting bad. We haven't had a McDonald's All American in it's going to be three years now. Right. And that had never happened before, right. not once. And now we're on a three-year streak, streak of, they moved of to it. Chicago that's, and it cursed Chicago. Yeah, I mean, that's how bad it is. So it, it's bad out there. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of factors, a lot of reasons. Um, there are some kids that aren't signing tomorrow that could wind up being high major, which would help the list. It mm -hmm. definitely helped last year. Last year, signing day, I was whining in a similar fashion. And we wound up having some players emerge during the season, like Terrence Shannon, who's mm -hmm. going to go high major. So it looked a lot better by the end. Hopefully that happens this year. But uh, let, let's run through it here quick. Um, Kieran Brayboy from New Trier is going to Harvard. He's a big man. Trey Kelvin from St. Viator is signing with Wright State. Mm -hmm. We talked to Fred Cleveland from Leo, North Carolina A&T. And then a, a player I think could have maybe gone high major if college coaches were a little smarter. And I think they might regret this one. But Tyler Cochran from Bolingbrook, mm -hmm. he is just a, he's a man. He is a strong beast <laughs> of a player. And he was just excellent last season as a junior. I can't imagine how good he's going to be this year. He's kind of an under the radar player of the year contender. Mm -hmm. And he's going to, he's signed with Northern Illinois. I've never used the phrase under the radar player of the year contender, and he's in going Northern to Northern Illinois. Illinois. I mean, that's before. how Northern gets into the you know Sweet Sixteen. Yeah. Or so, so that how? could be great for them. Um, 
Keenan Cole, a kid from Streamwood, big kid, 6'7", wing. He's also going to Northern Illinois. Uh -huh. Perry Cowan is an interesting case. He's a DePaul prep guard. He could have gone high major as well, he, but instead he decided to go academics. He's going to Brown. Mm -hmm. um, Ray J. Dennis from Oswego East is going to Boise State, which is one of the stranger commitments we've had around here. We don't get a lot of kids going to Boise. Um, Nate Ferguson from Lamont to Drake. Mm -hmm. Dewan Gordon, late bloomer out of Curie, is going to Kansas State. That at this point is probably is the biggest. Yeah, the biggest. Jeremiah Hernandez from St. Vider, who's just a smart, interesting player, is going to Kent State. Mm -hmm. He's one of those, I think if he maybe would have played the season out, he also could have wound up somewhere a little bigger. Uh, Marquise Jacobs from Uplift. We've talked a lot about him. He's going to DePaul, mm -hmm. signing on Wednesday. I did talk to um, him today. He's signing on Wednesday. I know there's been a lot of debate about that. We've talked a little bit about it on the show, but it sounds like that's definitely happening Wednesday. So DePaul fans will be very happy when that's, yeah, excited, that, that DePaul. actually happens. Don't get excited yes. for Wednesday. Uh, Lance yeah, Jones from are. Evanston, Southern Illinois. Marquise Kennedy from Brother Rice, He's going to Loyola. We've talked about him before. Um, then another interesting player, Tayon Neal from Providence St. Mel. Mm -hmm. He's six foot nine, six ten, strong. You can see the potential there. It hasn't quite happened in high school yet, but I had blue blood college assistant coaches calling me about him when he was a freshman and sophomore because they got one look at him and were like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. UIC got him. So that's going to be interesting for them. He can be really effective there, and a player that, when he's a junior and senior, could be a big difference maker if he sticks at UIC. Mm -hmm. uh, Evan Taylor from Glenbard West is signing with Southern Illinois. Alex Timmerman, a big man from Crystal Lake Central. Bucknell. Tom Welch, who we've talked about and featured mm -hmm. from Naperville North, signing with Loyola. And the final one, Joseph Yasufu, another bowling brigad, heading to Drake. So that's the list there. You know, there wasn't a single Big Ten school, which... Isn't it? We, <laughs> I mean, there have been times when we've had, you know, double digit Big mm -hmm. Ten kids almost. So it, it's an interesting class. They're, the big name still yet to sign, Chris Payton from Bloomington, mm -hmm. who at one point, oh, I'm screwing the, oh no, he was an Illinois State commit at one point, decommitted. Illinois is involved with him and a lot of other schools, so he'll be high major. Bryant Brown from Waukegan, he, he's an excellent high school basketball player, had a rough spring and summer, it sounds like. So mm -hmm. the colleges have kind of gone away. I think that's going to, I think he's going to be the kid we're talking about in March that there's gonna be big schools after. Mm -hmm. um, Tuja Tay Williams, 6'8", freak athlete, late bloomer at Orr, he's gonna wind up somewhere. And then Simeon's backcourt has not committed. Antonio Reeves is a senior that just transferred back to the city. He was in Arizona last year. He's an excellent shooter, 6'5 kid. Mm -hmm. And Kawan Clements, who's a star. And you know, I'm interested. I didn't hear a lot about what happened with his spring and summer, but I'm a little bit surprised that he hasn't found a spot yet. And I think he's gonna have a big year. So that's kind of the look of it. Hopefully there'll be some other kids, you know, coming out, but signing day is Wednesday. Things have gone really well for Loyola. You uh -huh. know, we got two kids. That's going to be good. Things have gone really well for DePaul with Marquise Jacobs. But if you notice, there's a name we haven't mentioned yet. And they're always the story of signing day because they have the big, massive fan base. It's Illinois. Mm -hmm. Illinois doesn't have any recruits. They have none. Nobody. <laughs> That's one. really weird, and it's a huge, it's like a disaster over there. Well, how is, um, oh my gosh, Chicago fans, forgive me, I'm playing Io, fans. Disarmed, yes. Yeah. How is he doing up there? He had a great first game. Um, it was Evansville. He was he was awesome. But I mean, to be a good college basketball program, you don't like need one good recruiting class. You need multiple, multiple recruiting right, classes. Right. You just, you just uh, need recruits. Yes. Period. They don't even have a player. <laughs> yeah, so How does I, that even happen? Yeah, they just keep missing. Um, I, I think they only have two scholarships this time. It, it, it was this. They were in this scenario at this point last year, and then mm -hmm. Io committed, and you know then they filled in with some junior college kids and some transfers. But I mean. This is a Big Ten basketball program, you know, that was in the national title game not that long ago mm -hmm. that is trying to piecemeal together and not even getting local high school kids. So it's, you just got to feel bad for Illinois fans at this point. Do you point. think it's the success that's the problem? Like, what's the issue? Why aren't kids... They don't make the tournament. And that's that's, that's it. it. Nobody wants to play for a school that doesn't make the tournament. And, you know, for whatever reason, Brad Underwood, you know, he did pick up Mark Smith from Belleville West, was Mr. Basketball two years ago. He mm -hmm. got I.O., but it just hasn't gone well. I don't know if things aren't connecting there. It, it's, yeah, it's a bad situation there. I mean, it seems ridiculous that a school with as big of a program as Illinois, a school with as big of a, it's a big 10 school. It shouldn't yeah. be this difficult, especially in your own state. Like these are kids in your own backyard that you're letting 
fall to, you know, all of these names you just mentioned. And that just, sh to me, should not be happening. Yeah, well, a lot of these kids they didn't want. You know, they never offered. They didn't care. Right. And that's been a problem again and Which again. Which is odd because it's yeah. like you don't have any recruits right now. Why wouldn't you want a guy like a number of these players on this list? Yeah. That's... Yeah, it's a real problem over there, and I don't really know if there's a solution with the current coaching staff or what's going to happen, but we will keep an eye on it. Um, that should be it for signing day. We will have tons right. of coverage online, tons of coverage in the newspaper over the next couple days. Mm -hmm. um, for me and Joe, Joe will have his list of the top 10 programs in the country who did well. I don't think any of the locals are on there, but we'll check it out. Um, all right, up next on the to-do list, Super 25, Beth, tell us what's the latest. Who's in, who's out? Obviously a few from this weekend's losses. Yeah, a couple in, a couple out. I will say, I saw, I think, Henry on here said, brother, I should be number two. That would mean Batavia would have to drop, and they are not dropping until they lose. So <laughs> Batavia is still number two, Henry, and for those of you listening. Um, the top of this looks very much the same. It's Lincoln Way East, Batavia, Brother Rice. Brother Rice did jump up here um, from number five, and they take on number four mm -hmm. at Maris this week. That's a really intriguing game. We'll talk about that all later. For those of the, those teams that jumped in, Joliet Catholic is in at number 25. They're, it's not the first time they've been in this season, and mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that they're really clicking at this point. I really think you, you kind of, they're like Loyola to me right now. Mm -hmm. I'd be pretty wary if I was going to play them because neither of those teams really should be where they are, and right. that means something is clicking, and it's clicking really well for Joliet Catholic and for Loyola. Um, also in is Crete. At number 22, another team, always a dark horse contender, playing some really good ball right now. And then at number 21, you're finally in Notre Dame. You beat somebody in the Super 25. You're finally in. I've been getting tweets all season long saying, why aren't we in? Why aren't we in? The one loss against Maris just didn't. I saw that game. I've seen them live. I just didn't feel like they had it. You guys have got it. You're in the Super 25. So those are the three teams that are in. Notable dropouts, Antioch. That's how Notre Dame got in, beating mm -hmm. number 25 Antioch. And then Glenbard West, when there's these, so many teams that are still playing, you got to start to drop out teams that, that lost out early because they currently are not some of the strongest teams because they're not even getting a chance to play. Right, of course. Um, all right, quarterfinal review, review. We have a lot to talk about in some of these we games. We have a lot to talk Simeon, about. Simeon, Nazareth, Mount Carmel, East St. Louis, and Phillips, Cary Grove were all the games that we were at. Which one do we want to talk about first? I think it's obvious where we have to start. All right, Simeon, <laughs> Nazareth. That was... I mean, it was a great game. It came down to the final seconds. Um, Nazareth obviously won 34 to 27. Beth, I'm going to let you give your take on that game first. I think Simeon, and as you guys would have noticed in my rankings, Simeon was ranked higher than Nazareth. I think Simeon was the better team, and I think on Saturday, Nazareth was the better team. They put up together a better game. They played more disciplined ball. That's what it really came down to for me. And you can say, yes, too many penalties. If you don't give a ref an excuse to make penalties, to t call a penalty, they won't call them. So yes, there might have been a few extra penalties that definitely didn't go Simeon's way. There were a touchdown called back on both sides due to penalties. It certainly didn't feel like the officiating Simeon swung the game. Simeon had two touchdowns called back. Um, Alante Brown's run, I believe it was in the third quarter. Um, and then on that For final drive, on the final drive, and, and again, what the ref says goes. That's just how it works. There's no we, replay. Yeah, you can't replay. Anything. Notice how when Simeon loses, everybody starts to talk about the refs and things called back because the entire south side of the city rises up and tries to come up with a reason for Simeon losing. It's like this in basketball, too. Because yeah. we haven't yes. sat here all year and talked about bad calls and I things because Simeon gets worked well, up. I would have loved to have seen Simeon win the third state championship for the public league. Who wouldn't want to, right? Like, yeah. you got to feel for them. <laughs> if you play them, yeah. right, you don't want them to. you got to feel for them. Nazareth is a program that has absolutely had a lot of success. Remember, Simeon could have and, could have and should have been in 8A, and Nazareth could and should have been in 6A, 6A, and they still came out on top. It shouldn't have been that close of a game if you're Simeon. Yeah, it was clear last week. We talked about Simeon. I think it doubled, well, 20-some penalties against Lincoln Way West. They just had to tighten you've things up. You've got to be disciplined yeah, you're not going like to Nazareth. Yeah. yeah, no, we talked about that last week, and the penalties was something that we said. If they're going to beat Nazareth, that's something that cannot happen. Um, 
to me, just being in that end zone and watching Alante, you know, reach for the pylon, hit it, stay in bounds. It was a tough, that was a tough I call mean, it's to always see. tough to watch a kid like that. No, it, it, you want I mean, to win. Right, and, and that wouldn't even have won them the game. They still would have had to either, you know, kick the extra point or um, go for a two point conversion. But um, yeah, it just, it, it shouldn't have come down to it being that close, but then when it was, um, you know, that's when you they led the fourteen to nothing, didn't they? So and then right. Nazareth came back with twenty-one yeah. un- unanswered points. Yeah, and we're also not just, talking about yeah. Nazareth. Like I've been talking about Simeon's explosive offense all year, and Alante Brown. I mean, absolutely lived up to the hype. That uh-huh. he is a fantastic football player. I'm so Definitely. excited to see what he does at Michigan, Michigan State. State. Mm-hmm. And Nazareth said, "We'll take your Alante Brown and give you a Michael Love." Well, they also um, Diamond Evans came yeah. up big. His interception. I think was the turning point of the game. It gave it sparked um, Nazareth's offense. JJ McCarthy and and um, Michael Love came out on that drive after Diamond got that interception and scored quick. And then Michael Love answered again with his kickoff return for a touchdown. Um, so they just had explosive plays that sparked their entire team. And Alante had it wasn't just Alante out there either. Um, you know, he had his wide receiver, Rashawn Palmer. Rashawn Palmer, yeah, had um, a great game. You know, there were key playmakers for Simeon, too. The, the penalties was just too much. It, it, was, it was tough. To, it was tough because without those, it, it wouldn't have been that close. And I think Simeon would have had that as, game. I mean, easy, as I said, I think easy. Simeon was the better team, but they weren't the better team on Saturday. And I think Michael, after, after Andy and I were talking to him, summed it up pretty well. When you look at the difference between the discipline of a Nazareth and the discipline of a Simeon, mm-hmm. when Simeon has the raw athletes to certainly win that game, Michael, we asked him about a 75-yard um, punt return, which really that sparked the game after mm-hmm. Evans' um, interception. Mm-hmm. And he said, I watched enough film to know that Simeon runs um, straight down the field and all I had to do was get around one of them. Mm-hmm. If you're that predictable... You know, like, if that's all it takes is, like, I know I can take this 75 yards to the house because I've seen you do this every single time all year long. But also, that's how you win. Why, why was it even being kicked to Michael? Well, like, that's another never question. Should have even <laughs> it never should hands. have. Like, Michael, oh, my gosh. It never should have touched that kid's Agreed. hands on a kickoff. Um, but, yeah, it, it was a great game. It was fun to watch. Um, you know, it was heartbreaking in those final seconds to see, you know, the scatter and just the – confusion on Simeon's end not to get that final playoff but um you know great game by both of them and Nazareth moves on if you want to see the final 15 seconds it, I do have it on my Twitter I wasn't even really sure what was going on but I was videoing it um so you can check it out at Beth underscore along I believe the Sun Times uh preps retweeted it as well mm-hmm. if you want to kind of like see what was going on and it was truly the most disorganized chaotic thing I've ever seen in a high school football game um, yeah, it was. It was. A, there was a little bit of confusion on that side. A lot. Um, Welcome to uh, Simeon Public League football. I remember when they had the twenty-minute delay against Phillips when everybody stood around. Yeah, it's nuts. I think it's um, yeah. <laughs> um, next up, Mount Carmel, East St. Louis. This game coming into it, I was expecting. I'm not gonna lie. I thought East St. Louis was gonna win this game. Looking at the numbers they put up, I think they everyone did. Fifty-four points per game um, coming into this game. And Mount Carmel's defense shut them down. It was very impressive to see. And um, I think, I don't want to say we haven't given Mount Carmel credit because I think we've acknowledged what a talented team they are. But, I mean, this just did it. They're, to hold East St. Louis to just 19 points, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know who, I think Mount Carmel's going to be in the state championship game. I mean, we talked about it earlier. I think they have the easiest road to the state title game of any team that mm-hmm. we've been talking about. Um, and this is not just like coming out and beating East St. Louis. They blank them two years in a row. East St. Louis has got to be like, let me star circle, try to schedule Mount Carmel as many times as I can because I can. Need I, I want to beat them. Yeah. And they just came back out, knocked them out for the second year in a row. And also worth noting, like Mount Carmel's defense hasn't didn't just do this against East St. Louis. They are only giving up or only allowing seven and a half points per game yeah. and had four shutouts this season. So. That unit over there, and um, um, Mount Carmel's quarterback, Brad, I always mess up his name, that's what he said, too, you know, after the game, was that it's their defense that keeps them in the games, and 
of course, teams always preach that, like, de- you know, defense wins championships, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's the thing that stayed but, the same. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. still a lenty in charge right. of the defense. Right. And it's the same. These kids grew up, you know, the last right. four years running that same defense that is apparently just has East St. Louis's number. But, yeah, looking at those East St. Louis scores and, mm-hmm. you know, the quality of competition they'd played. Right. And, they played out-of-state, yeah. um, top out-of-state talent. It's not like they were scheduling weak opponents by any means scoring 54. Like, they, they played a tough schedule. And there's not even, like, the excuses. Like, you know, Phillips didn't make excuses, but it was, out up, up in Cary, it was a mess. Uh-huh. You know, grass field, dirt everywhere, people slipping and falling. East St. Louis at Gately was on turf and right. should have been able to speed around nice right. conditions. And Mount Carmel just has their number, I guess. Um, it is worth noting, I mean, they obviously had to travel a long distance to yeah, get Yeah, but they the do game. that. They like right. it. That's so their thing. They so, want to. Yeah, they, they choose that every yeah. week. So, if anything... I think they don't want to play at home. So, yeah, it's kudos to Mount Carmel. And I don't know if anybody, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, that was pretty. And they scored. Right. You know, 29. It's not like right. they've had. Because right. that was going to be, the, that was my concern with Mount Carmel. Because mm-hmm. the offense just hasn't looked super effective. Mm-hmm. But, I mean. Um, they got it started with, uh, gosh, I think it was like a 25-yard field goal. Um, and then Rad just got things got things going. He connected with a couple of his receivers. Um, and it was like a quiet 29 points. You know, by the end of the game, you're like, whoa, they put up 29 points. Mm-hmm. It wasn't um, super flashy, but they got it done. Um, question we got coming in here. Does Loyola have a chance to beat Lincoln Way East? Dun, dun, dun. I mean, I we'll, we'll hit that in a second. Truth? Let's finish the, uh, <laughs> we, we have a whole oh, semifinal preview. Yeah, true, true. Okay, Phyllis Carey Grove, let's break down Phyllis Carey Grove. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's not a lot, a lot of tears on that Phillips team after that game. It was rough for them up there. Carey Grove is just really, really good, and Phillips couldn't rush the ball. It was very much like the Simeon loss they had, where they just could not get a ground game going. Every once in a while, you know, they were able to rip off a big pass play to Billingsley or Fabian uh-huh. McRae or something. But when you can't really sustain a drive with the run game, it's tough up there on the road against such a great team. I mean, Jaleel Billingsley had 13 rushing yards, and it got, I think, 11 or 12 rushes, and half of them were negative. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> I they mean, they they're, and they, you know, I talked to a lot of the Kerry Grove defensive kids afterwards, and they were talking just how huge he was and how, <laughs> how incredible he was. But, it's what Alabama recruit yeah, looks like. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, they, he was not able, he just couldn't get anywhere. I mean, it was, they, they just completely shut him down. It was a close game, though. It was an excellent game. Uh-huh. Two teams, you know, that are really good on both sides of the ball because Kerry Grove wasn't really able to really dominate offensively like they wanted. They did put up huge rushing totals. All three guys came close to 100 yards in the triple Mm -hmm. option, but they weren't able to really get that big run. You know, it just came attrition-wise over the course of the game. And Ben McDonald is the difference maker for them, that quarterback. You know, I saw it in the Prairie Ridge game. When you've got – he just doesn't ever screw up. And he's in the triple option making those decisions, and he doesn't throw interceptions. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he doesn't throw incompletions hardly ever. He's got, like, less than a, a dozen all season, mm-hmm. plus that rushing attack. I don't see anybody in 6A beating this team. I mean, Kerry Grove, they're one of the three or four best teams I've seen all year, I think, regardless of class. They're really excellent. I, I think it, it's you're hesitant to say they're as good as the Prairie Ridge teams the last couple of years because they mm-hmm. don't have that Samson Evans standout. But they're just so tight everywhere, you know, Mm -hmm. and and they're an excellent team. I I think the field was a little rough for Phillips. You know, it is an excuse, but it was more torn up than any grass field I've seen all year. Mm -hmm. It was bad, you know, especially right up the gut. People were falling right and left, so that does take away from Phillips' speed an awful lot. Um, Wasn't a great game for Fabian McRae. Had a couple balls go off his hands that would have made a difference for them. I was starting to wonder if, you know, he the Illinois decommitment, a lot of pressure on him now, a lot of uh-huh. people watching. It, that would have helped a little bit. And in the end, the quarterback situation just haunted Phillips all year. Leonard Smith played pretty well early, but then interceptions started coming. They'd move Billingsley in. So, I mean, you're not going to get to a semifinal without a settled quarterback. Right. I think, I think all in all, though, if I'm Phillips, yeah. I look at the season as, like, a swimming success. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. And that's – I mean, they jumped up another class. Class, right. And, and did it with class and did it yes. well. And they lost – so their losses to this, this year are to Simeon, um, the, the, you know, Ohio power, mm-hmm. and then on the road in a state quarterfinal to Cary Grove, who will likely win it all. So, yeah, good for them. Uh, you know, I wish more basketball programs had that mindset where they played – 
they rose up to the level they should be at mm -hmm. instead of, you know, Phillips could be down to 4A now pounding. Oh Teams. God! Everybody, now that, that's not yeah, I don't, I don't that's not going to be helpful for anyone. So yeah, you don't want to get too down on them. They didn't have the year I, I don't think they expected for sure, or any of us really did, mm -hmm. because you know in all levels of football, the quarterback is such a key. And having you know, it was good to have Billingsley there sometimes, but you're also taking another weapon away. Mm -hmm. You know, he can't throw to himself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and that, that is actually that's a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, yeah, it didn't go real well for them. But We saw similar yeah. things with Quavon Skeins. I don't know if you mm -hmm. guys remember Quavon Skeins. He's, oh, like, yeah. he's at UConn now, but there was a point in the season where like Quavon just couldn't do it all. Right. And this is, I think, where Phillips ended up. And for me, like this just solidifies that Phillips is going to be a player, just like Simeon is, year in and year out. This is not a fluke. Mm -hmm. Like, we'll be seeing them, and we'll Back. be talking about them in 2019 and beyond. Mm -hmm. The other, um, real quick, brother Rice blanked Warren 20 to nothing. Uh, Maris beat HF. The Loyola blanking of Maine South 17 uh, to nothing. That? Wow. Can you talk about that <laughs> yeah. for a second? That like, was the wildest what one. What is yeah. happening over there? I mean, I'd be How more are they shocked doing this? if they did it against Lincoln Lee East. Like, they're, I would say, like, not going to happen. Maine South, the, their thing is they just couldn't be a one trick pony. And when they turn into a one trick pony, a team like Loyola could take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And I think as the season went on, like, Maine South was good. I honestly felt the same way about Mount Carmel. I saw Maine, Maine South played in Mount Carmel, and I was like, both of these teams could be beaten. Mm -hmm. And I, and when you see Lincoln Lee East, I'm like, I don't know how anyone's going to beat them. But, like, you could get Maine South's number. Mm -hmm. And Loyola did. I mean, Loyola, this is a team. Yes, it's Loyola. But if you take away the name, all that kind of stuff, they needed overtime to beat St. Ignatius. Mm -hmm just this season a few weeks ago right. that's i mean sorry san ignatius but i mean that doesn't a team does not go from that to the 8a semifinals like ever i mean it's been quite a job and you know, i've seen some of these games in the playoff run and it's not like anybody all of a sudden got great right you know, that's or is what i'm like busting my, open I'm big like plays yeah the defense has locked down and i mean they know what they're doing um quickly batavia once again Comes from behind in the final minutes. They won an oh, overtime against tested. Willowbrook. For Willowbrook. Yeah. They're tested. Uh, Michael Janzi Jr. had the big run, a key field goal to send it in. Um, we talked about Nazar Simeon. St. Charles North, 21 to 10 over Wheaton South. Uh, Crete Moni kept going. Annie's mm -hmm. going to be out there tomorrow. She'll have a story on Crete Moni for us. Notre Dame, we talked about beat Antioch. Richards, close, closer than some people thought against Normal West. Uh, 22 17, so they're still going. Uh -huh. uh, Hillcrest and Jolie Catholic, we talked about advanced. Montini's still going in 5A. We do have two local teams and two Catholic schools in 4A mm -hmm. uh, that we expected. McNamara won, IC Catholic won. They, they seem to be on a collision course. Mm -hmm. And Lyle went down, lost to Byron. So we do have one team we left. Surprised in, by that, though. No. We have one team left in 3A, Hersher. We have no locals left in 2A or 1A. Aurora Christian lost. Which means I might not have to show up super early on Friday in Champaign Ooh. unless I want to cover the one and two A games. We'll see how that goes. But um, <laughs> yeah, not, it's, not, it's going to be a really kind of dead local Friday for us. You know, mm -hmm. we're used to having maybe Phillips as a oh, nightcap yeah, on 4A. Absolutely. But now, yeah, we might not have a whole lot going on at all. All right, semifinals. All right. What do you think? Let's. Let's, why don't we all say what our, what our favorite game is, what we think will be the most exciting game? Instead of just going through, and then we'll go through mm. of all of these. Okay. I'm just intrigued to hear. I think the best game is going to be Batavia and Nazareth. I think Brother Rice and Marist. I'm excited to see how that one plays out. I mean, the Battle of Pulaski is going to be fun. Uh, and Brother Rice, I've been doubting them all year. Clearly, I'm a fool. Um, <laughs> they've done, you know, really well. But um, do we think Marist can challenge them? Yeah, Marist. It's Think not the so. most fun to watch. I've seen them a few times, but they, their line is just overpowering everyone, uh -huh. and they can gain three yards at will. I just think that's going to so. be an incredible environment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it'll be a lot of fun for sure. I, but wait, that's how I started the season. I just realized that was the first game of the year. Um, it's also really yeah. hard to beat a team twice. Yeah, so that, that one was at Brother Rice. Um, and it took and like, what was the final score? I don't remember. All I remember is it took me an hour and a half to get there, and it was just 14 miles down Western, and I was having a freak out. Um, <laughs> I don't remember the final score, I think but it was uh, like a Maris good won. Game. Yeah, it was pretty yeah, close. It was yeah. a good one, and this one's at Maris, so we'll see. Um, no, I think I'm interested in Hillcrest Joy Catholic um, a little bit. We haven't covered either one of those teams yet this year, 
And I think both of those teams, you know, are good programs historically. Uh -huh. And it would really be exciting, I think, for both those communities to one of them to get back in or to get into a state title game. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, one, one of, of our going to. Yeah. <laughs> one of our questions was, do we think Loyola um, stands chance against Lincoln Way East? That's our other eight-day I mean, we would have said they wouldn't be here at this point, so right? why not? So who the heck sure. knows? I mean, really, could they come out and blank with the yeah. race? I don't know. They it's did. Sec is like a miracle worker. It's at I Loyola. Really it's in Wilmette. They don't lose there very often, so that's going to be tough. But this Lincoln Way East team, I mean. They're really good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're oh, 20 to 16 was the score of Thank the Brother you, East Marist game. Daryl, you're a rock star. It was a good game. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think like you said, tough place to play. They don't lose at home, Loyola, but they're not going up against, you know, anybody. They're going up against no. the the best team in the state. So um, it's got to be like Lincoln Ways minus thirteen and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I was gonna make a line, I mean, they have to be heavily favored. They're the best right. team I've seen in three or four years. Yeah. I mean, no one's even come close to them no. the entire no. year. But watch. Loyola will make it close, and then we'll be talking about it next week. I mean, do I hope they do. What I'm wondering, uh, Batavia Nazareth, two of Beth's uh, teams she's been very fond of all year, going There's at one another. There's good reason they're in the semifinals. It's at Nazareth. <laughs> I saw some complaints online. Everybody's like, this is why Nazareth shouldn't be in 7A, because their stadium's too small. And all these Batavia people want to come, and they There's can't nowhere. fit. Yeah. Speaking of state championship crowds, Batavia is like, notorious for packing the house. I'm yeah. very curious. There, there is a lot of standing room at Nazareth, but, yes. but I don't really know how Isn't you Isn't the one that. visitor side like all standing room? Like you can go, it's you like, just have to stay. I don't it's think like there's four bleachers. little bleachers. Yeah, yeah. It's not very big. And that's not something that I just think, you know, it's because of the success factor and multiplying right. and all these it's formulas about, that's though. got them up there. But yeah, so you do have, you know, a, a pretty small stadium for a, a very big game. How do we think that matchup will pan out? I mean, I picked Batavia to win 7A. So I'm going to, my bracket's pretty good for 7A thus far. And the only thing that I haven't had right was St. Charles North over Wheaton Wearable South. I should have mm -hmm. bet on Tyler Newman and I didn't. Um, but I, I'm going to say Batavia. I, I think this is going to be the best game of the week. I think this is a really even matchup. Mm -hmm. um, the difference for me comes down to Nazareth really until last week hasn't been battle tested and Batavia has over and over and over and they somehow come out on top mm -hmm. and I see them doing it again this week. Yeah, I feel um, like Batavia's rushing attack is going to be able to do what Maris did to Nazareth. You can see a lot of parallels but there. But that's the thing I'm curious about because Nazareth took that loss and it was a bad loss and I think they've learned from it and what I'm interested in seeing is their um, passing game with J.D. McCarthy and Michael Love and there are other weapons out there, how Batavia is going to be able to stop that. Um, and, and they've got good defense. I mean, I think Nazareth has learned from that loss, so I don't think that run game is going to be as big of an issue as, you know, we think in comparison um, to the Maris loss, but... Uh, and I just think their passing game is going to be really difficult. Batavia I, has those linebackers. I feel know, like the yeah. X factor is the defensive line and linebackers for Batavia. Uh -huh. And when we saw Mar Marist, yes, frustrated them with their rushing game, but they really frustrated them on the defensive line. Okay. Like Mar um, Nazareth's offensive line just could not give McCarthy any time. And for that team to win yeah. and to blow people out of the water like they have, McCarthy has to have time. Um, he's only a sophomore. Like You can't expect him to be pressured in the pocket and make the right decision every single time, even mm -hmm. though he does most of the time and he throws one of the most beautiful balls that, like, of anybody in Illinois, um, that, that is like your X factor. Can Nazareth's offensive line hold up to the defense of Batavia? And we've been saying all season Batavia is one of the best defenses, if not the best defense in the state. Um, interesting little fact I want to share here. Loyola has been to the state championship or been eliminated by the eventual state champ nine of the last 10 years. So this will make it 10 of 11. Um, if Lincoln Way East beats them and then goes on to win the state. Yeah, none, I mean, Loyola win. none of those Loyola teams resembled this one no. <laughs> at yeah, any point to me. This um, is really so Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Up. Next up, um, Mount but, Carmel at St. Charles North. What do we think of that matchup? What do we think of St. Charles North? Because they weren't someone that we predicted to make it this far. I saw them live against Wayne Warble South. Yeah. Um, I thought they were both solid teams. Mm -hmm. the, truly, the difference maker is Tyler Newbin. 
Uh, he's a heck of an athlete. He stepped up when they needed it and, and really drove the game for St. Charles North. Mm -hmm. My biggest question with this game is, I'm not sure that Mount Carmel's seen an athlete like Newbin yet this year. There's not a lot of them in the area, if anybody is as good as Tyler Newbin. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious how Mount Carmel's defense reacts to a kid like that. Mm -hmm. East St. Louis must have had. You would think so. Like that, oh my God, guess, East, yeah. St. No, East St. Louis had athletes. Like their quarterback, their running back, um, stars and, and Mount Carmel shut them down completely. And Newbin is a star, not that those guys weren't, I'm sure they were fantastic, but Newbin is a star who's going to Minnesota who's a really smart football player. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's surrounded by kids that may, they got here. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that, that matchup really works. And I, I feel like Mount Carmel is one of those teams that now we've, we've seen their offense and truly their offense is really similar to a lot of other offenses being run right now. Mm -hmm. So. They don't really have that X factor. Kerry Grove has the X factor. You don't see a team like that all year. They don't really have that anymore to kind of confuse people. So we'll see. I think that's the big matchup to watch is how does Mount Carmel's defense react to Tyler Newbin. All right. Um, question from Mike. Notre Dame versus Kerry Grove. That's our next game up. Um, what do we think of that matchup? Kerry Grove, heavy favorite, I would say. Someone <laughs> I was who, say who's seen both thing. of them. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Notre Dame has enough. I think it depends on how Ty Gavin shows up. Yeah. And he's, you know, been – dealing with a high ankle sprain, so he's not 100. But even I think even if he's great, I don't think you can go in enough. against a Cary yeah. Grove team and only have Ty Gavin. Like, I don't think that's enough. No, no that's, yeah. Notre Dame is a pretty sorry, no, I know. Notre Dame is a pretty solid team. They gave Maris to run for their money, uh -huh. and Ty Gavin has to be, like, healthy and just, like, on it for them to beat Cary Grove. Rich, right now, he, he really is, and he's battling it's that It's in Niles, ankle sprain, and so. it'll be wild, so that'll be fun. It'll be interesting. Okay, next up. We kind of touched on it. Richards at Crete Monique. What do we think of that matchup? I think Crete Monique could give Richards a good test. Um, I don't know that I would completely bet that I'd take them to win, but I think this will be a challenge for Richards. Yeah, Richards is the favorite, but on the road, you know, you never know down right. at Cary Grove or down at Crete Money. <laughs> um, I mean, I, Richards is who I have winning 6A. Yeah. Okay. I'd stick with it. Last two, Montini at Sterling and Hillcrest at Joliet Catholic. Montini, big favorite. They do got to go out to Sterling, though. Wait, with Montini, though, with the way Montini played in the Catholic League Blue, you've got to think that they're a big favorite through the end of this. I mean, oh, the Catholic sure. League is now like, whoa, the Catholic League was a lot better than we ever gave them credit mm -hmm. for. And Montini hung in there in 5A with a bunch of 8A teams. Right. Most of them whom they beat. Right. Loyola. Yeah. <laughs> and they weren't, it wasn't that bad against Brother Rice. No. Yeah, no, Montini's definitely, I mean, the thing is we don't know much about Hillcrest. Yeah. You know, we haven't seen them yet. Mm -hmm. Their schedule didn't give them a lot of tests, so they have these huge scores. We're not sure. They are messing up with basketball, though, Hillcrest, because <laughs> Hillcrest. I go back to basketball. Yeah, Hillcrest plays one, a lot of their best games are early, and now mm -hmm. all these kids are playing football. So it's going to, their running back, Marquise Irving, who's been phenomenal this year, if you look at the numbers, he's also a terrific basketball player, so that's going to kind of hurt them this week. Um, we already touched on 4A3 and 1A. Um, do you anything else you want? Player of the week. Player of the week. Player of the week. Fun. We all just like went on like a little row down. <laughs> player of the that week. Player of the week. Player of the week. Player of the week. <laughs> Person. It's, our player of the week is always Annie. Always. <laughs> just kidding. You read just it. Just kidding. Just kidding. I was just um, I'm joking. Like, I'm saying you're my player of the week. Oh, guys, you See? hear that? Week in, week out. <laughs> it's always Annie. Sorry, Michael. I'm her player of the week. Michael's uh, not. Michael's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I saw that coming. He couldn't care less. <laughs> all right. He's like basketball, basketball, basketball. Um, all right, player of the week. We have four up this week. First off was actually a submission that was tweeted at me, and then after some digging, I agree. So Jamal Sappho from Crete. I always encourage you guys to tweet at me who, who did we not see um, mm -hmm. and who needs to be in this conversation. Jamal had 121 rush yards, rushing yards. One touchdown there, 134 receiving yards, including a 98-yard touchdown reception, two touchdowns. So he had three touchdowns total for Crete. I'm mm in -hmm. um, a nice win to advance on. Second option is Sam Tumulty. We've talked about him a little bit this year from Willowbrook. I mean, what a game oh against Batavia. God, numbers. He was Read them off. He was 25 for 42. Um, he threw for 396 yards. I'll say that one what? more time. 396 yards, what? four touchdowns, three of them in the final seven minutes to take the game to overtime. Mitch Trubisky had 355 yards this, this Sam, weekend. Sam, you beat Mitch compared. Trubisky. Yeah. Congratulations. Well, that's a I talent-wise, mean, that, that. though. It was up against, I mean, <laughs> no comparison, but I'm just saying. 
396 yards is a lot. It's a lot no matter what classification, yeah, division, right. or whatever. That's a lot of games. Um, so Sam had a wonderful game. And then Annie and I saw Michael Love live. He had three touchdowns um, from Nazareth. Great game. Great athlete. Like I said earlier, uh, Simeon said, we have Elante Brown. And Nazareth said, I'll, I'll take Elante Brown and I'll give you Michael, Michael Love, Love. And I'll win this game. 75-yard kickoff return for touchdown that really sparked Nazareth to Everything, kind of like yeah. get in the game when they uh -huh. were 14 points behind. And um, I think I said this, but he had three touchdowns, a couple through the air, one with that 75-yard kickoff return. And he also had a two-point conversion, mm -hmm. which is, in the end, what really, like, tipped the game to Nazareth. Right. Fourth up is Danny Daigle from Cary Grove. Cary Grove has been playing such ball solid ball all year, and it's hard to kind of, like, pick a player of the week from Cary Grove because normally they're so evenly spread out. Mm -hmm. And this week, Danny had absolutely the best game of any of the running backs up, or any of the athletes up there. He had three touchdowns for 115 yards, or off 115 yards. Okay, Who no question. Um, well, actually, no, a couple questions. <laughs> this is hard to pick because Michael Love was the difference between a loss and a win for Nazareth. Mm -hmm. You know, you take him out, they don't win that game. But Sam throwing for 396 yards and four touchdowns, that's insane. But they didn't win. But to me, that's a better, that's, Sam, you're my player of the week, Sam. <laughs> Who would you pick? Daigle. Um, you know, that's the game I was at. He's not big. He's not that fast. He's very normal. And Phillips is huge. Phillips is fast. Yeah. And he was amazing. Three touchdowns just in the first half and a key interception. I mean, a couple times it looked like he's got SEC recruits trying to rip his head off <laughs> in the mud. And he's just <laughs> plowing on through. I mean, it was, it was definitely the toughest performance I've seen from any kid all year. Uh -huh. so Cary Grove well. is tough. That yeah. is, I mean, if you're going to put a, a name on Cary Grove, that is always what Cary Grove is. Um, well, last week we all agreed, and this week none of none us agree. None of us agree. So, Beth, why don't you tell us who the player of the week is? <laughs> the player of the week is Michael Love. So, the reason why, not only because he absolutely won this game for Nazareth and it propelled them, a team that is a smaller classification, into the semifinals of 7A, but, and also not because he got a two-point conversion, because, you know, I love people that do things in all different areas of the game, but Nazareth couldn't have advanced without him mm -hmm. on the field and no also he's been in the conversation for I think three weeks in a row mm -hmm. it's about time we give him the crown yeah. so Michael Love congratulations you are the player of the week looking forward to seeing what you and the rest of the team and the rest of these guys that are still playing do next week yes very interested in seeing what happens next week we will be back of course next Monday same time same place 4 30 p.m make sure you tune in thanks so much for watching guys